Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about Mission Impossible 7 Dead Reckoning Part 1. Alright, so I had a little bit of a weird experience with this movie. And talking to a friend about it, it's... My concern was, I was surprised when I first started watching this movie that it said Part 1. Maybe I didn't follow... You know, trailers and stuff, but it just didn't occur to me. And I think in the back of my head, Mission Impossible should be standalone movies. It's just, you know, it's a Mission Impossible movie. I just, don't, it didn't sit well with me in the beginning, but I don't know if it, it, it turned my experience. But what I started noticing is, I think I was actually preparing myself for unnecessary long scenes that just are repetitive in a way. How many car chases are we going to see with crazy driving? How many planes? How many motorcycles? It just started, it just kind of, you know, ruined the flow for me. But getting to the plot and the premise, which is surprising again for me because I'm really interested in AI and technology. Me and my friend talk about it all the time. I do science reviews here and off oh, reviews, science, you know, podcasts and stuff on an article, let's, let's say. And this should have been really captivating to me. But I found the first 40 minutes almost, I was scratching my head like, okay, this is the opening, okay, this is the theme music plays, and I just didn't feel it. And again, I was thinking afterwards, was it just because I saw that part one? And I'm going to lean on the side of no, really. Maybe a slight impact, but I, I, I see these movies all the time, and I enjoy a lot of them. But let's say this is, the, this is the seventh one, so out of the six, I can't say one was garbage. I just might prefer one over the other, but I can feel the buildup. Something's got to be bigger. It's got to be better. It's got to be more crazy. And it just starts wearing on me. I want a good espionage movie with a couple of twists in it, and this feels, it just, I don't know. AI entity, and they go through all this trouble, and Tom Cruise effort, stunt people, just amazing, just incredible stuff, uh, just for the fact that they do that and go hardcore, top notch, but well, why do you fucking cheap out on one of the major villain? probably a great, great actor, well, let's say not the major villain, because that might be the fucking AI, we don't know, but you've got this sort of villain, and I don't like the way they injected it. You got six movies. You couldn't do a callback. You couldn't have placed a plot thread in one of the first couple of movies that you would carry over. You mean, or, or find one. No, you had to make up a new thing, if I'm correct. Maybe I'm wrong. And it reveals a, a new thing about Ethan, Tom Cruise's character. And it feels like an unnecessary uh, thing to just introduce and get us into the what's going on. So, this guy's you know, one of the major villains of the movie, or the major villain, he's working for the entity, I guess, so to speak, the AI. And throughout this whole movie, there's just incredible stuff happening. Even if I'm a little frustrated with the pacing and all the special effects, all the stunts, I just look hardcore, and you can't, you can't fault him or production teams for that, in that sense. <clears throat> but you got the major villain, and he has to fight one of the women first, then the next woman, because it's one of those, oh, Ethan, one of them's got to die bullshit. And it just didn't work for me. I'm like, why bother? You got the great actor. I don't know how CGI works in, in, in a sense, but I've watched the fucking prequels in Star Wars. Like, it might not have been the best, but you can do things. Quick cutaways, whatever it was. I was really disappointed in it. Because let's say the actor is good and he should have been, he's in the part. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Age. You know, we will see Keanu Reeves with Neo and stuff. It, like, it works. Even Lawrence Fishburne and Trinity. Uh, it just felt like it was short change. And it came back to haunt me when Tom Cruise is confronting this character. And there's a lot more at stake here because did one of them die? Is he going to take him alive, which he's supposed to? And it just felt bland, like... Uh, again, I had this problem with one of the Highlander movies. I forgot which one it was. It was the one with the newer Highlander from the TV show. 
And they've got some amazing sword fights in the movie. But the main villain is a dud. It just doesn't work. There's no real choreography that shows me uh, the level of expertise that they are. And again, you're talking about people who get out of situations that are insane. Uh, kicks, punches, dodges, uh, environmental weapons, the whole, the whole thing. And yet these guys face off, and he faces off again, like this is previous, with one of the women. And it's, it almost seems like on one end, it's just... Not there enough for me to go, oh, this is dangerous, or this is, you know, this is, no, it just felt like he's written that way. And when, you, when for me, when you add that with, low, I don't need to see, a, like, a, a half-hour driving scene that, you know, they do crazy things, and they get into different cars, and they go backwards, and down steps, and, okay, you know, how many times have I seen it? Am I, I'm waiting to get to the meat and the bones of this uh, plot. And it kind of gets all over the place because of the agencies and operatives and new people that, you know, a good sleight of hand or thieves. It just didn't feel like a well-paced thing. And you know what? For people who might like that, if it ever is it well-paced, sure. Again, I don't think any of these Mission Impossible movies are garbage. I can't really recall one, and I've seen them all. I just know I prefer one. I even like the nostalgia of the first one a lot. And I always watch that one. And these things have been going on for a long time. And you just upping things. Why not make a tighter, more, you know, espionage, thriller. It's always running through the streets and someone's in peril. It just, you know, it doesn't feel new. It just feels like retreading constant things that the seven movies before it did. And what's the new thing? Oh, AI is the hot topic. So... And even that, which should have got me, didn't. It felt lost at times, hidden in the in the patchwork of putting, you know, a script together and getting it on, as a movie and having it flow. Whoever's decision it was and here and there. And it feels like you don't really, maybe you're not supposed to exactly know and it's supposed to be in the background. You're dealing with human experiences and the struggles. And, but again, it just felt like I'm re you know, going over things I've seen before. And is it, is it that stress fatigue point they talk, they talk about like superhero movies and stuff? Well, I never get sick of them, but there's <clears throat> superhero movies I don't particularly think are good. Some of some those I even like. So what gets me halfway through, three quarters through this movie and not really caring that much? So again, this is where I came to my discussion on when I'm looking at you know, I was excited to, to see the movie again. It's one of those movies that was on my, you know, list eventually I know I'm going to see. Uh, you know, and the director, Christopher McQueen, the writers. I don't think there's a, a major floor except for maybe someone. This is the way they wanted to do, do their movie. Break it into two parts. And maybe that didn't sit well with me in the back of my mind then. These long drawn out scenes I've seen before, same type of peril, a new edition where they didn't, you know, bring something out from the past that could have really been a little more epic. It just felt like at some point in this movie, I started not caring. And usually the theme gets me going, right? You know, the classic theme, and I'm old enough to know the TV show. Well, maybe not. Well, re or at least reruns. There's a. A charm to some of these movies that I really enjoy, um, even when I don't think there is epic or you know, you know, pulse pounding blockbuster movie. I enjoy a good, sophisticated thriller, psychological, espionage. Even the um, disguises are like so apparent and I don't know in your face. It just feels weird. The side characters again. The, the cast, I like them all, generally. And there's a part here and there that, you know, you get drawn in. Look, these are great actors. Um, even even the supporting cast, like I said, uh, you know, except for maybe bringing in the crazy chick every once in a while and she screams and kicks ass. It's just, you know, add a twist, but obviously, right? But, just, again, this is a part one. And when you're getting towards the end, you, you see where it's going. Okay. Again, confrontations and what's at stake. Uh, a real important discussion with his team. 
or one of the team members, and Ethan knows he can't kill this villain, Gabriel, I think, and he wants to because they need the information, that type thing. And I just didn't really feel it. They have this kind of fake out death thing in the beginning, and and then it kind of is foreshadowing, I guess, but. I got him running through the fucking streets for like a half hour while he's while the villain Gabriel's fighting like one woman at a time and like again daggers or against a sword and it just didn't look right. Now maybe it's like I said, it's a jarring thing in the sense of oh, you know, just enjoy the movie, and I can see that. So again, this is not. I don't think this is a garbage movie, but you've got a you've got some heavy things going on here. You got the AI. And what that means, and the way they frame it, the way they put it out there, it makes it, uh, you know, almost godlike in that sense. What it can do, what its capabilities are, and who wants it. And by the end, you kind of figure out there's a, a purpose to it. But you're going through, and you've got these really weighty things. Ethan's past that's revealed a new thing, I think, I could be wrong, with Gabriel and choosing someone he loves, someone has to die. And the stakes of a new person being brought in who's, you know, scared and vulnerable. Great actress, you know, pretty good stuff. And you got the intrigue on the agencies and what they're doing and who's doing what. You know, you start off with this submarine scene and it's, again, it seems like a lot of effort went in. Could it be one of those, it's got a time limit and someone had to piece it together maybe? I don't know. But I definitely would have cut down parts, you know. Maybe even cut out parts. Like, you really needed a driving scene that was bonkers again? Like, I just, it just just didn't feel right. Especially because I'm, yeah, again, I'm trying to get to the end of a movie that I know is not going to resolve in a certain way. So, again, I'll admit that. If, it, if it's even a thing, who knows, really. But... Some of the uh, plot points, like I said, are so deep that they just start drowning other aspects of the movie. How invested am I in, you know, Ethan, Tom Cruise, and his team, and the new person, or the agency, or the villain, or the sub-villain, and another revealed sub-villain, and, you know, things got to change hands, and, well, it's the end of the world. It's supposed to be this entity thing, whatever it is, is so... Capable, powerful, and it's already manipulating people, uh, um, controlling them in a certain sense. And I guess you could see it as this day and age, a internet entity, or even if it was a person behind the keyboard, could blackmail people and get them to do things. So, okay, I get that. And using the uh, information, it's erasing truth. There's that aspect to it. So you've got the stakes at the end of the world, and. It comes down to people who want to use it, regardless of who they are, what what nation, what country, and then Ethan, who wants to destroy it. So, okay, we've got that. But again, when you're bringing me on this ride, and I'm investing in the the woman from the first or the last movie, and he, he's, there's this connection between them, and you know. It just goes to another connection, to a new person, to, you know, this guy is so dangerous, the team, you all have to disperse, and and they meet up again. And I, I don't know. I, I really wish I would have a better, more, like, Top Gun. I was surprised how good it was in that way. Uh, not something I really even was thinking of watching, but this maybe could have just used a little more editing, a little more get to certain points and hit them and let them breathe, maybe. And the parts that do let breathe, just, it didn't impact me. You know, Tom Cruise is running for a fucking half hour. He's got two women in peril. One's down, the other one goes down. He gets there and it's his moment, right? And granted, there's nothing to say, you know, Tom Cruise, he's not phoning it in. It's, you know, well, at least for the most part, how do I know, really? But good actor, he's, you know, doing the part. And again, 
villains that kind of come out of nowhere towards the end of a part one of a movie that, you know, just kind of muddy the water a little bit, and then we got to have this insane train thing at the end. I mean, again, this fucking type of thing has been done a lot where you just, you know, you take one part of the train off, you disconnect it, it goes shooting off like a rocket, you know, and then it crashes somewhere, and then the rest of the train is trying to slow down, and then the first compartment that gets to the edge dangles off, breaks the pin, falls down, second one, and that's where the heroes are, well, you know, and then it's the whole fucking thing of getting up, and again, this is, how many things are in this movie like that? And so part one, can't you make like part one the real tight thriller, espionage, uh, you know, psychological warfare type movie? Because this movie tries to hint at it, because you've also got the agency stuff, which is a subplot with agency people who are not, well, one of them, you start seeing they're not sure what their own agency is doing because they have to go after Ethan. Because that happens in like almost every movie. And there's a, one of the same guys is in the movie, you know, from the agency, maybe a new guy. And it adds up. And for me, and going into this, I was in a good space. Well, in a good, you know, maybe not financially, but mentally, um, things have been really good. I was excited to go into it in that sense. I, and as I'm doing this, I'm just still trying to think of a Mission Impossible movie that I, I thought was bad. I mean, you know, maybe since I've been doing these for a while, like I would go back, but since they're, they're not made in that sense, but maybe I did a podcast on Mission Impossible movies. Maybe that'll be something I'll do. Again, the plot with the, you know, AI to the history with Nathan, new people, old people coming back, the team. And just like, let's make everything pivotal, epic, and almost transitions to another scene. And the fucking motorcycle thing, I mean, you know what's coming. You know what's coming. And it's, what, like, all this to get on the train thing? It, look, this could be someone screaming out there, you know, you're an idiot, you went in with the wrong head face, fine. I just, I, I guess that's its theme, but I don't think there's a um a moment here where it just captivated me while I was along for the ride, like even the last half of the movie, right? This is something like uh, you, your movie can be halfway decent, but if you pull it out in the end, it could be one of those things, that, you know, you can pull it out. Nothing did this for me in here. I didn't feel that uh. That moment, it grabbed me and pulled me along. Again, crazy stunts and, you know, upping the game in that sense. Okay. You know what? You got characters and they come in and new and they, some of, you know, off the, off the charts, you know. You got to have some sort of, uh, you know, oddball type thing. And look. A lot of the situations from that I find charming, maybe about the first one, the second one, I don't know. I just found it to be, you know, in my memory at least, a, you know, two, three epic scene type thing in a movie, but they're not all so bombastically, you know, repetitive or, you know, you know, we see a car, it's chasing, it's going to crash, you know, people are after it, people are joyfully chasing them, and it's just streets, and Italy, maybe, whatever. And, okay, good scenery. Oh, let's get an electric car, and they smash around, they're handcuffed. Okay, you know, but maybe make it short. I think, like, the born identity type stuff with the fast cuts and stuff might have served its purpose, but I don't even remember how long this movie was. And it, and I'll be honest, it's not something I thought was dragging on for too long, so I'm curious now to actually find out, again, how long was this movie, but, I, you know, I guess I could look on the page, but. What didn't grab me, what grabbed me, I, you know, this is a, a weird one for me. It happens from time to time, and I try to examine, you know, what it could be for me, but an hour and 63 minutes, right, so. 
Wow. Uh, okay. Let me see if my producers can do the math. Hold on. Hold on. Wow, the guys behind the glass are saying it's like two hours and like 40 minutes. <laughs> That's a long fucking movie and it's part one. Again, you know. I can I watch Lord of the Rings. I I watch the extended cuts, four hours stuff. So I'm not even saying it's too long, but nothing connected me enough that I was riveted and driven forward. And where these little things like you know you smile and you wave it off as wow, this is part of the craziness of the movie, and it just happens again and again. And like I said, with the fucking motorcycle, and he's got to find the highest point. And is it really this epic? You know, I seen you hang off a plane. I seen you climb rock faces like upside down vertically. Like, what aren't you going to be able to do? So you fucking drive the motorcycle as fast as you can off this fucking ramp that's naturally made by rock formation. And okay, you just fucking do your thing. And of course, it's going to have those moments where it quickly cuts away and you see the resolution so fast that. You know that they cut it on purpose or to make it a big a bigger impact than it seemed to be. Right? Because you didn't see the real lead up to what's how close is he getting to the train. Because he jumps off the the mountain with the motorcycle to get on the train, which he missed. Long story. Blah, blah, blah. And okay, so someone's about to get killed. Ridiculous, by the way. You know, timing is perfect. Boom. Ethan's there. And again, you ended with this train scene that I can recall the Jurassic Park moment where they did it. You know, pretty cool with the glass and stuff. It was, I, you know what? It was shorter. I mean, if it wasn't, it just maybe just proves too many epic long scenes that are drawn out are, you know, just weird on me in that way. <sighs> Dead Reckoning, Part One Mission Impossible. What's that actor's name? I don't want to shit on him. Okay, yeah. Isaiah Manuel Morales, Jr. Good actor, but you, you got to replace him with a stunt guy or give me some impact in the stakes because you could set it up, maybe. You know, okay, they're on top of a train, wind and stuff, but he, I saw him fighting with the, the women, you know, previously. I just didn't, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy anything about that. And when you're looking at the bigger picture, right, all the stuns, all the little slow motion things, and, you know, they do that great, where things are connecting to other pieces, but not enough of that for me to hold me there, to glue me to it, to be taken on this ride and have a smile the whole time at the end go, okay, wow, you know, this is what, you know, they did, they chose to do. And it resonates with me. This felt like I was constantly brushing against something that was stopping me from being carried along on a, on a ride. And it's a Mission Impossible ride. Again, I, I, this is the seventh one. I've watched them all. And I'm still... I got a feeling, though, there is one that I don't enjoy as much. But I have time to go back and watch them again, maybe. And getting to the end with the train, so... you. Again, I might have not even mentioned how many times, you know, big, bombastic, epic things happen. But after the train, you know, you, you know it's coming. It's part one. And we've got to set the table again. You know, I don't know how much I bought of it. Like, was I excited when it ended and I got the hook for the part two? No, not really. A Harry Potter may have done the same thing. Maybe that's an indication of something. But I think I was tiring by it from those movies. And maybe that's happening here. I don't think a firm rule of uh, certain things get fatigued. Like, you know, how long westerns were out and how popular they were. So I get it. You know, we'll, there are shifts and things. Mission Impossible. Seems like a formula that can work in almost any day and age. I would have made this 
AI thing, more personal thing, like, uh, who's the person who made it and what's his connection? Is he helping? And what are his stakes in this? And they briefly go over things, I'm not giving spoilers much anyway with this plot, but maybe that should have been a way to go at it. It did one of these things with one of the Die Hard movies, and I thought it was pretty good. Like, the movie wasn't great, but at least he made an effort to kind of personalize where the story was flowing from. And right off the bat with this movie, the first 40 minutes, I said, um, it's, a, it's a weird, it was a weird experience for me, even though it might be classic uh, Mission Impossible movies. I don't know. Thinking back, uh, I think it might be, but right, AI and the whole thing, and it kind of has to connect again. Then there's a rescue mission for the clue, which is a key, which is in two parts. And there's a whole thing with that throughout the whole movie. And you know what we haven't done yet? A huge desert storm action scene. Well, you know what? A desert storm's a desert storm, right? I mean, I don't know how fucking unique and uh, exciting you thought you were going to get, but I was like, what the fuck is going on? Everybody's got things on. and The first thing you don't do in a movie is that people with automatic weapons like machine guns shooting at people at a distance in front of them who are on horses and they're on horses also but it's showing me like six or seven horses just going fucking down and that whole thing and then the desert and the sand and who's who it, uh, it didn't work for me and here you go where am I getting really hooked and driven into this and the best part I think might have been the new aspect, the uh, the thief, let's say. The, uh, I'm not sure the actress's name. Hold on, let me see if I can find it. And even her, let's say, you set her up, uh, this, um, this new character to be a um, novice. And, and it works. But the villain Gabriel is a real scary fucker, right? So it, it it just didn't sit well with me in that comparison. Like who's doing what? I don't know. I get a uh feeling I watch this again, I'm not gonna have such a different impression. Sometimes I, I, like I know I'll watch this again, without a doubt, most likely. And I'll try not to be, you know, uh, biased in the sense of being aware of it anyway. And take another shot at this and see if maybe it flows better. You know, time of day, smoking weed, whatever you're doing, could impact things. And distraction, you know, you're, you're focusing on something. So, who knows, but I wonder how it did publicly and... My, what, my, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. Well, I guess it costs a lot. I'm going to guess this was, I haven't read the, oh, I guess I did breeze over it, though. I'm going to guess this wasn't a monumental success. Let's see. Oh, the COVID shutdown? Okay, I can see that. Even New York now, it's, yeah, uh, post-production, marketing. You know, I gotta say though, for certain aspects of the movie, they just they really nail it. But I think it's time to just make it quieter, make it uh, more resonate with human feelings and the struggles they're going in, they're going through. You got great actors in, on all ends of this uh, supporting cast, uh, people who even show up. There's, there's a Good aspect of a casting, um, you know, director. And I'm, I'm going to say this again. The theme song should always get me. Like, sometimes I just hear the song and you just start, like, nodding your head and you're watching this, you know, scene unfold in front of you. I, I didn't find it enough to just keep me riding, you know, keep me going. Again, I don't think this is a, a, a bad 
a horrible movie, bad movie. It's just maybe one of those not for me. And would I recommend this movie? If you're a fan of them, maybe. Again, I might watch them all again because now I'm curious. But was this uh, character foreshadowed? Was it even talked about, like his personal history? Why he joined the team, what his choice was, what pushed him over the edge? Because I didn't think there's a line of dialogue in this movie that says the Gabriel character, Isaiah, made him who he is. And if that's more than they let on, and maybe that's hinted at in other movies, okay, I'll give them credit for that. But when you add it to a part one of a movie, again, this is just me just trying to realize, going into it with good spirits, going into it with a you know positive attitude, I'm kind of being let down and a little frustrated at points. Uh, almost like unnecessary stunts, unnecessary blockbuster things. And it just maybe peaks out a little too much here and there and then gets a little bogged down. And I'm not kidding you. Like, I was watching the um, last John Wick movie, I, my review on it, and they had a scene where there was a fight on the stairs and they kicked the guy down the stairs and he rolls down the stairs and it's fucking, you know, long. And then he gets back up and they got to do a whole thing and he gets kicked back down the stairs again. And some of the scenes in that are just fucking ridiculous. This isn't like that, but even if you're trying to do a great chase scene here and a mix with a really good fight scene. And then you get to this scene that's not so epic because whatever qualities of the villain, whatever, you're intercutting that with uh, Ethan, Tom Cruise, running to make it there in time. And there are villains in his, uh, in the beginning, there are villains in his way. It's just uh, a little overloaded. And not in a way that just kept pumping me up to the next thing, go to the next thing. It's just, not a hor- I'm, again, not a horrible movie, just not for me in this uh, frame of mind or whatever. You know, ready to watch a more sophisticated thriller. And maybe that was in the back of my mind too. But when I do these, uh, I want to try to sometimes at least make a distinction between what I think might be an objectively you know, good movie and the way that it was put together, filmed. Uh, you know, vistas and camera shots and just how much fun I had with it and what subjective about it, what, you know, what frame of mind was I going in to begin with. And, again, Mission Impossible 7, Dead Reckoning, Part (laughs) 1. Not a hit for me, not something that's terrible, maybe a little too long, cut it down, take out some stuff that shouldn't have been needed. You got a great cast. Good to see people come back. Uh, I like that about the movies. Curious to know about the Isaiah who was hinted at. That's going to be interesting. I think I am. I do enjoy them, so I'm going to go back and watch them. I guess I recommend it if you're a fan of them, but if you don't know Mission Impossible, I wouldn't recommend this probably. Probably not. A two hour and 40 minute. Is that right? 120, two hours. It's just a little too much. Uh, And just throwing a lot at you for a a part one to figure out an AI godlike entity. And again, you know, I know movies have them. You know, they have to have their layers and, you know, backstory. COVID, you know, shutdowns, uh, not a real continuous filming or up on production and stuff could clearly be part of it. So maybe they get, you know, for that effort, which is why I wouldn't just start saying this is a rant against the movie. So there you go. I recommend it for people who have watched the series and are familiar with it. And you know what? Even if you're a fan of the old show and this might be one of the ones you're getting into, it it kind of has a feel with, if you look at it from uh, Ethan's new addition to his history, and maybe why he joined the team and why this Gabriel is the one who made him what he is. So I could see that. So first time I could, you know, who at least knows about the show though. That aspect of the you know mission if you just if you choose to accept it. You know, things like that actually are interesting to me in, in the show. And I'm actually okay with some of the inter policy espionage and 
who's on who, you know, t- who's on whose team. I just don't think it resonated enough for me to just get super excited and, you know, so, you know, talk to my friends about it and get a, you know, a, a dialogue going. It's going to be one of those movies that just, hey, you know what? Maybe this is a, uh, it doesn't resonate for me, but it, it the, the second part will, you know, nail it. But I, I think that, you know, it's not fair to give it that credit yet, but maybe in hindsight. So. There you go. Watch Mission Impossible. If you think this is a continuation, part of things you know. And if you're a first timer, you know, okay, I'll give it credit that it might add a little bit levels to it. And then all these bombastic things might be, you know, so first time for you that it just seems like a roller coaster ride with the right dips and dives. For me, you know, a little too much. So there you go. Hope everybody's doing well. Take care. Till next time.